Um, I think we're live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the talk. Sorry that we are a bit late. Um, we just had a few <laughs> technical difficulties. Um, yeah? Are you guys hearing the echo? Yeah. Um, okay, is that better? So, um, welcome to the Heritage Month talk about language and science. Oh, are you guys still hearing that? Yeah, I can still hear that. Okay, I, and now? Do you, do you have a headset? I do have a headset. One second. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, let me just get it. I did not realize. Technical, they should always drop up. <laughs> Where is my headset now? There it is. Okay. Oh, let me do this quickly. <laughs> we are there. We stay some <laughs> Okay. Ah, oh, that's me. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and we start again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Month talk about language and science, hosted by the Human Evolutionary Research Institute, commonly known as HEDI, and the Digging In podcast. Um, my name is Robin Humphreys, and I'm a student in the archaeology department at, at UCT and in HEDI, as well as the coast, the coast of Digging In. Um, Hedy was established with the explicit aim of exploring our evolutionary past while driving processes of transformation and creating space for conversation, conversations that make science and paleoscience more inclusive. Concurrently, the Digging In podcast also aims to explore our amazing archaeological record whilst unpacking how this research has historically been used and how relevant it is and how it's relevant today. <laughs> Um, so please engage with Celindo, the other half of digging in on Twitter, um, and with Laura Doden, who will be tweeting for Hedy. Um, in terms of human evolution, South Africa has an amazing hominin fossil record um, dating back to 3.6 million years with important recent finds such as Homo naledi and Littlefoot. It also has a wonderful paleontological record, with, which includes some of the earliest dinosaur communities. Today, South Africa has a rich cultural heritage with 11 official languages, second only to India in the number of official languages, yet these languages, yet only two of these languages have um, the scientific vocabulary making science communication easier in English and Afrikaans, um, marginalizing the nine other languages um, and denying the engagement which com communities may have had with these fossils in pre-colonial times. Um, and there's no denying that this problem of South Africa's colonial and apartheid past in which language was used as a weapon to control and subjugate. Um, thus, we are exploring how this has impacted science communication and doing research as young black researchers, as you can see on our screen, <laughs> how our panelists. Um, uh, this wonderful fossil heritage is tied to a murky past of day science, which um, provided the scientific language to justify marginalization and violence visited upon Black South Africans, as well as invasive research practices, such as the making of face masks. This close relationship between day science and evolutionary research impacts how we communicate to the public or how, who have historically been harmed by scientific practice and language. They've, Therefore, there is a need to recognize this when engaging with the public. Um, we need to recognize that scientific language is not neutral and ease of confidence. Um, so we will take questions at the end of the talk. Um, so please put them in the chat box below and I'm going to ask our speakers to introduce themselves. Um, Loma, can we start with you? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, speakers. My name is Maui Tushazo. I am a PhD candidate from the University of Cape Town. I am also a, a Harry affiliate as well as the affiliate of the University of Copenhagen. Um, so should I just talk about my research a bit as well? Just to... Yes, yes, please. Great. Um, so <laughs> what I look at is an extinct hominin, um, the genus Paranthropus. So I look at variability within and between groups of the genus Paranthropus um, through the cranium, the mandible, the dental remains. And I also use um, other groups, um, extant species such as gorillas, uh, chimps, as well as humans, to use them as models to estimate the, var the variability that exists within these groups um, of, of species found in Paranthropus. 
Thank you, Norma. Um, Siku Siso, would you like to go next and just introduce yourself? Hi, um, everyone. I am a science writer. Uh, officially, I am a science communicator for a small science company called Science Link. Um, in my free time, I've dabbled in some opinion writing and I've volunteered some of my time uh, writing some science articles for Cybri, uh, it's a science news website. And in on that website, I've tried to write uh, some science news articles in Isuzu Blue. And that basically began my journey into uh, decolonization and I've uh, been having that difficulty at the beginning uh, and translating science terms in my native tongue um, was the whole idea behind uh, decolonization. And that's what I've been uh, talking about and writing about uh, so far. Okay, uh, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Ryan Daniels. I'm a genomics researcher from the University of the Western Cape. Um, my research focus predominantly on like pre-colonial history using so we use genetic data to understand the, the dynamics of mixing between people. So um, well, one example is on the arrival of the bunch of language speaking communities into Southern Africa, there was a change in dynamic in the interaction with the Khoisan communities. So my work is then to understand how this affected the genetic mixing between the different communities. And for my PhD, I did something similar, but looking at the, the ancestry within the colored community within South Africa, so seeing if we could identify the sources of the slave population that were brought over. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we are all young researchers, and we've, we've, we started our scientific careers, and there was sort of already a language that we sort of stick into. And my question is how has, um, what has your experience been with scientific language? Um, and anyone can start um, with their Sorry, What has your experience been with the language of science? Um, how has that, has the language that we use in science, how has that um, impacted your communication or your experience as a scientist? Okay, I can, okay. I can start if, um, if that's okay. So I'm going to start with a little bit about my background first, because I think that's an important for discussing this. Um, so right now I'm doing genomics research, but when I started out, I actually wanted to be a paleontologist. So I did geology, botany, zoology, and then at some point I decided to change my mind. So I gradually moved into genetics. But my background is therefore like very broadly biology. So I came in with this um, this very strong training in scientific terminology and I came in with uh, sort of being very unquestioning about the words that we were using because we were working on very different systems and there's a different power dynamic to it. So if you're doing a project on snails, for example, there's no concern about how the words affect the snails, you know. But then when I, when I moved into working with people, when I worked in projects that involve people in discussion, then obviously this is a concern. And I encountered this when I moved into doing the, my project, my PhD project, working with the colored communities in South Africa, because then obviously you are dealing with people, you're dealing with their opinions on your work. Um, and in a bit reflectively as well, you're dealing with your own history in the process of doing this work. So you are encountering for the first time how the words that you have been using in other contexts is being used on you now and on your family and you as a researcher using the same terms to discuss other people. So suddenly the, the contention and the aggression and the force that's in these terms that you're using is really right at the front. Um, so that, yeah, that, that was one of the first things that came to mind when, when I thought about how to answer this question. It's just also the transition that I had to go through in order to do the, the PhD and then the postdoc. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I think like I definitely um, it is that resonates with me. I did a project on hybrids <laughs> um, for my masters, and then I read about hybrid 
research in terms of humans in the past and and colored people would fall within that category and some of the research was very um yeah very questionable and very difficult and so like it even made me question the word hybrid and like what what do we mean when we say that when we refer to humans um norma or so what has your experience been like norma um like Ryan, I also come from a very scientific background, having done biochemistry um, in undergrad. So when I started doing human evolution and working with human remains, um, among the other um, groups that I work with, um, when looking at catalogs of, of um, this human's remains, I mean, the wording of, you know, expression number or specimen number, and I understand that we have to catalog things, but these are not things, these are human remains. And so I think for me that experience of actually uh, going to, let's say the dark collection or looking at um, remains from UCT where um, in this Excel spreadsheet, it will say, um, you know, the sex and, the, and the, the, the population group. And it'll always just have it as a very scientific and very cold and very like, um, withdrawn from, from you know, the humanity of it all, dealing with people. Um, and for me, I would say that it was shocking and it was a very um, negative experience uh, look, working with these human remains, working with different collections uh, when it comes to human remains and how we treat um, these people that were once their people's parents, grandparents, etc. And we're very far removed. Well, at that point, I felt very far removed before and then when I came into this, I started realizing how problematic the language that I've also been using within my work um, and how it can translate to other people. Thank you, Norma. Um, Sibu so would you like to share your experience? Um, um, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you're not speaking, can you mute? I think there's some feedback from the other speakers. Um, when when someone is speaking so if you could just mute if we're not if when we're not speaking go ahead cbc so okay uh so my experience uh with the language of science um it actually created my career uh i grew up watching a lot of popular science uh media um and just talking about science in general in it's something that's not too weird or far removed from everyday life. Uh, I grew up liking this stuff. Uh, it was weird when most people didn't like it. But anyway, um, uh, as I went to university to do my um, physics and chemistry undergraduate degree, I was shocked at the at the language that I found there um, in terms of if whenever I got access to high level uh, scientific writing, it stopped sounding like um, humans talking to other humans. Um, and at first I thought it was maybe a uh, some conventional thing that in order for one scientist to understand another, there has to be a certain way of writing and the way you talk about your work, but it just turns out that it's it's this sort of um, uh, decorum that people have that um, I want to be respected by other people, so I want them to take as long as possible for them to understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Maybe it might make it sound a bit more uh, 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 impressive than it is. I've always believed that a person's work should be uh, should be uh, sh sh should speak for itself. And um, growing up as <clears throat> I mean, growing up as the um, as the science history nerd that I was, I read a lot of old papers, uh, like very old papers, where scientists used to write like they were writing for other people to read it. So having that experience of finding that uh, there's this huge. Uh, change in how scientists talk to each other discouraged me from becoming um, a scientist or it was one of the things that discouraged me from becoming a scientist. Uh, for one, I didn't want to do just one thing and the other, I wanted to talk about science as much as possible in the most simplest way to reach the most people. So that was my first experience and from there I became a science uh, communicator, worked as a journalist for 
for a, for a while. Um, and then my second experience came when I decided uh, that I want to write science articles in Isizulu. And I thought uh, that it would just be another uh, science communication exercise. Uh, it should be easy, uh, not in the sense that uh, the work would be easy, but that I would just have to uh, write scientific, uh, the scientific article in Isizulu. But I found trouble uh, thinking that I'd find trouble with complicated scientific terms. I found that it was trouble with simple scientific terms, not because they weren't uh, word for word translations from one language to the next. It was just that it was difficult to even translate uh, something as simple as a fossil, uh, something as simple as DNA, like some, some complex things to explain, but things that in English everyone knows uh, how to talk about them. Uh, so that's when I started having, started looking into why is it difficult uh, to do that uh, when with any other language, maybe like uh, <clears throat> Afrikaans, it's very easy to talk about Africa, uh, science in Afrikaans, but you can't do that in, um, in, in, in African languages or African indigenous languages in South Africa. And then the more I looked into why that's the case, the more I discovered more and more about decolonization and what it is. And that's when I've been more interested um, in that sort of uh, stuff. So that's been my experience uh, with science and, and language. Um, thank you, Sibu So, And I think, yeah, I think that was a beautiful summary of the issues that, that when it comes to language and science is that when we communicating about ourselves um, and about people, it becomes a, a lot more complicated than when we're con communicating about other organisms. And also there's a sense of detachment from the people that we do research on, which Norma discussed. Um, and and Sibu Siso, there is also science that is this ivory tower that is inaccessible to the world. Um, and I think that impacts how people perceive science and how people engage with science. Um, and so given all of that, what has your, how has that, those issues impacted your research process or how you communicate science um, with the public? Um, yeah, anyone can go ahead in terms of talking about the impact of, of this objective ivory tower language that is that sort of distances you from the public um yeah okay i'll i'll dive in again um so the i think what i'll talk about is the narrative which is something that was quite big with the stuff that i was doing because i spent a lot of time reading history um yeah reading history reading um, a lot of work on social identity, ethno-racial identities, um, and especially particularly with the work that I was doing for the PhD, looking at the, the colored communities in South Africa and the narrative around that, because um, I think one, one of the big distinctions that you have with the, the South African colored communities versus like the, the uh, black communities in South Africa, Zulu, Susu, et cetera, is that a lot of the, a lot of the um, black communities still are very strong sense of identity tied to heritage, tied to language, tied to culture, whereas um, because of the way people were brought to the Cape Colony and the conditions that they were living in right from the get-go in the earliest Cape Colony, there was massive disenfranchisement. So um, the narrative has always been by and large um, owned by European settlers. So discussion about the, the Cape Colony community has always had a heavy um, a heavy overtone of European um, dictatorship, European um, narrating exactly how these people got you and why they got you. Um, so when I was reading through the literature, what I noticed is that a lot of the work, especially in the 1980s, had words, they used specific words which had heavy connotations, like uh, miscegenation was one of them. Um, so miscegenation is mixing between race groups um, and unlawfully or against uh, tradition, to, against uh, religious norms, it's like sort of a taboo mixing. Um, so even just that one word already kind of indicates that the, the, the author had the idea that this was one, this was wrong, this was a violation of some kind of law, even if it's not a legal law. 
And the the other point is that there's this primordialism or essentialism that you know people are inherently different. That these groups are these groups of people are biologically, culturally different, and it's, it's a given, it's a fact, kind of thing. Um, so in in the process of doing my work, like because again, because it, it, it's one of the upsides of coming from a very different context is that I didn't have too much of um, baggage in having been trained under different, I don't know, a different. Um, a different time when these words were normal or having them kind of ingrained my writing. So I was quite happy to do away with it. And when I when I wrote on the cult identity, I just kind of tore out any any narrative that started with, oh, the colored population started in the 1600s. Like, no, it didn't. Communities were there before the 1600s. And we now have, um, not from my work, but from other people's work, we now have evidence that even the, 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 the San and the Khoi Khoi who were in the Cape Colony pre-1600s, had already had admixture through other events that came before and some of it was admixture with Eurasian groups from the Middle East or from Europe even. Um, so it's not that, you know, it's not that the the whole admixing that we see in the colored communities today just started in the 1600s. It's been going on for a long time. Um, so that was the first thing I did in my writing is, is just kind of get rid of this narrative that things started in the 1600s. And that's me. Thanks, Diane. Um, would, Norma, would you like to share your experience and the impact of science learning? Science I would um, agree with, with Ryan in terms of um, when reading literature, um, coming across really problematic words. And um, for me, what I've tried to do um, um, with my my thesis that's word, is to try and really um, move away from the, the, the heavy jargon-filled um, sort of no one who's going to read my paper or my thesis is going to be able to understand. And my objective um, is to make my work um, comprehensible to the normal South African, African global public and be able to ask me questions and be able to relate. Because I found that, you know, in my field, definitely how we write is very exclusive, is very exclusionary to other people and therefore is not involving the, the, the public. And so what I've tried to do is definitely try and move away from that as heavy handed um, in terms of mathematical statistical words that I have to use. I have tried to focus um, my thesis in, in a way that it will be able to be comprehensible to the greater South African public. I mean, um, you and I have previously collaborated, collaborated and are still collaborating on writing um, um, comics and, and such for, for kids, for the youth. Um, about you know fossils in a way that they'll be able to understand because we can't be living in a country where we're so fossil rich and not have you know all the youth and that means all the, the 11 official languages out there um, for them to understand what fossils are how geology works how everything works and you know how you know um cradle of, of mankind humankind has been has been here and why it's important to us we have to put that message out there and if we keep using these these um terms and, and jargon then we'll never be able to have you know anyone understand what we do and the importance of of fossils and paleontology in general thanks Norma. um thanks for your feedback so so do you like to share ah uh, um for me, how it's impacted my work is that it's impacted uh, how I try to communicate science in general. A couple of a couple of years ago, I um, I decided to for a local newspaper that I was working at, I decided to write a science column about the sun. Uh, the sun was going through some activity back then. I think it was 2015. Uh, there was a lot of activity around the sun. Um, and I decided to write about it exclusively in, in Isisulu. Uh, in the past, I would write something in English and then translate it to Isisulu, but then I noticed that it's different if you start from Isisulu and then just uh, go with it uh, that way. I think for a lot of uh, indigenous language speakers, they can tell when something has been translated and it just goes to show um, the complexity of uh, what happens when you switch from one language to another. Um, and you realize that when you switch from one language to another, you're switching from one audience to another. 
right? So um, I, the people that I targeted were people who would read the Zulu part of the newspaper that I, 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 I worked at. And whenever I wrote a cool science column every, every couple of weeks or so, I would get a teacher from, uh, from a former Model C school who would call me and say they're very happy uh, with the column and uh, the teacher and the class always look forward to what I'd be writing about and they'd be discussing it with the class. But when I started writing uh, some articles in this is Zulu, the audience changed. Um, a lady from, an older lady from uh, my neighborhood approached me and told me <laughs> facts about the sun that would never have uh, uh, transpired if we had, um, if I had written it in English. It's not something that she would have uh, 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 checked out. So it's, 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 it's not so much that um, people don't understand English, they speak in English, but if you're going to speak talk to them about something that affects their daily lives in, 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 in Isuzu. What I've noticed is that you can talk about sports and all sorts of other things in, in a native language, but as soon as you switch to science or technology, then suddenly you have to switch to, to English. And then now English becomes this visitor that only comes in uh, unwelcome and it just changes the whole mood. So. Um, in my journey to try to talk and write about science in Isuzulu, it's been to reach people that it wouldn't reach otherwise. Not because, again, uh, to emphasize, not because they don't understand English. They very much do. It's just that it's better if it's spoken of in, in Isuzulu. Now, the trouble has been that a lot of scientific terms and phrases and ideas are not easy to express in 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 Isuzulu. So that's been a welcome challenge for me because it's made me want to explain uh, things that I take for granted that everyone understands. For example, uh, we take for granted that everyone knows what a dinosaur is. We know what everyone. We take for granted that everyone knows what a. Um, a, 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 a what a dinosaur looks like or what it is, if you say it in English. But then if I try to say it in Isuzulu, then I have to explain what it is. And then I start to realize that actually, even in English, people think they know what a dinosaur is uh, in general, but they would see a lot of creatures, uh, ancient creatures, and think that it's a dinosaur, or other creatures that are more uh, related to mammals and that aren't dinosaurs at all, that are just giant lizards somewhere. So I've taken the idea of translating or talking about dinosaurs and, uh, and thing, other things like that in Isuzulu to sort of move away from the misunderstandings of uh, what dinosaurs are in English. It means even if you don't understand what a dinosaur is in English, you might get a better chance of understanding what a dinosaur is in Isuzulu if I try to take a bit more time to explain it. So that's that's been my experience. It's been a great um, scientific exercise, I mean, science communication exercise to try to translate um, um, stuff that I take for granted in English, but you realize that I don't understand it as, as well as I think, or people that I'm talking to don't understand it as well as I think uh, they do. Robin, you've muted yourself. Muted. Again, I'm oh, sorry. Um, so, Super Cecil, <laughs> when you wrote your article about the dinosaurs, you also challenged your readers to to take that 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 storytelling legacy that is part of being Isi Zulu and to tell stories. Um, have you gotten any feedback on on stories about dinosaurs from people? I was just curious to know. <laughs> Uh, mostly what has happened is that uh, when it comes to talking about dinosaurs since writing that article, it, there hasn't been much uh, movement uh, or anything like that, but there has been a lot of interest from people uh, to talk about this stuff, just to hear. Um, what's happened is that I've, I've attended some, in pre-COVID times, I attended a lot of 
um, workshops and um, and other events where there's a lot of school children there, and I usually just throw it out there to them to come up come up with what they think a dinosaur is. I explain it as best as I can in English, and then they try to come up with uh, 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 Zulu names or other other names in their native uh, languages. So the, what I usually do is. Uh, think of a planet. Uh, I think a lot of us know what a planet is, or we think we know what a planet is until we have to explain what it is. But if I explain it and say, think of it as, as uh, when you look at all the stars, it's the only thing that wanders in the sky. And I mean, that's the whole idea behind the name planet. I think it's Greek or Latin for wanderer. And then usually you, the, the kids come up with their own uh, word for meaning uh, 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 wanderer in their own language. So yeah, that's, that's basically been what the um, sort of movement has been in, in that regard. It's, there's nothing, I mean, there's no lexicon somewhere where every time someone comes up with this stuff, it's, 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 it's written down. Uh, what I've tried to do is not come up with words so much, like I'll show you how, my, how I came up with a certain word, uh, but sort of challenge you to give you a formula of how you can uh, come up with a word if you, if 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 you don't have one. So that's 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 been that's been what's happening. Thanks, you will see so, and thank you guys for your wonderful answers. I think you really highlighted the range of issues that we that like our experience. Um, fix how we 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 work as scientists i think ryan um the the ability as a scientist to change the narrative is so important and i think often as scientists we say that we're neutral and objective um and and this is a apolitical um sphere but when it when it comes to humans that's not the case uh, it's more accessible to the public and we do want to we want young people to be proud oh, Robin, of your connection our is dropping. translating okay am i am yeah, i here now, now? Here. i think Can you uh, hear the me? last thing i heard was you talking about the okay narrative. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I was just saying that, that as scientists, we also participate in constructing narratives. And I think it's important to um, recognize that we have that, that the authority and power. And as scientists, what we say is of consequence. And we have to be very thoughtful about that. And we can even use that to challenge narratives that are very negative. Um, and then what Norma was saying about, again, making science accessible, making making it accessible to young people so that they can be proud of our heritage um, and engage with that research. And then what CBC was saying, I think that's such a good guide, such good guidance um, in terms of if you're going to translate an article, start in the language as opposed to start translating from English. Um, and, and all of the stuff that you learn um, along the way um, and that you've done, and I think so many people could learn from you in terms of writing in their own language um, and for the public. Um, and also changing the science in a way because because you're not saying um, ancient you're saying ancient animal <laughs> you're using a more correct scientific um, term in Zulu. So my question is, given all of that, what do you think we can do differently as scientists moving forward in terms of the language that we use in our research when communicating with the public? Um, what would your advice be to other scientists um, and maybe to the public who engage with the research that is that is shared um, in the public sphere? Uh, I'm not sure if Ryan wants to start again. <laughs> yeah, OK. I can start again. Uh, right. So. I mean, I think there's a number of things that we can do. The, the I mean, the, the obvious one is representation in science, because this is, this is one of the things that we can, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to be in control of the narrative in order to change. This is something that can be done from the outside. And I think like uh, the whole, the whole argument of transformation in science is probably not something that came from scientists. This is something that came from a very political stance. But once we have the representation within science, then we, then we have more um, we're better placed 
to actually discuss the narrative in science because in one we are actual scientists so we have the context of the work that we're talking about as well as the the background and the experience to talk about the narrative and what it means and how it looks so i mean the first yeah from from my side at least from the very academic standpoint is the representation if we have scientists who are people of color uh, i suppose it extends to all kinds of other things as well like if you have uh, you know sexual orientation diversity or um, religious diversity all of that kind of stuff if you have people who represent their their background, their um, identity, then they can speak on behalf of their community and their experiences in changing the narrative in the field. Um, and it's not just about, I suppose it's not just about, you know, challenging the narrative for the sake of challenging the narrative, but often like the narrative necessarily excludes other, other truths from the world just because the narrative is only one narrative. You need to have that diversity in order to kind of account for all, all kinds of other ideas that have come up and perhaps that have been overlooked. Um, and I think as, as scientists, I feel like we should have a louder voice outside of science, like on platforms like this, on a podcast, on a blog post, on um, on public forums, giving uh, presentations at museums, or um, I think there's some pub events as well where people go for a beer and then people, PhD students present their work, that, that kind of stuff. Like, I think we need to have a more a sort of outward facing um, persona as scientists as well so that you know, people don't have to go buy a newspaper articles in order to get to the content of our work, but that we can, as a scientist, we can actually communicate what we're talking about and who we're talking to um, so that we can, we don't lose touch with exactly the, the communities that we're working with. We don't lose touch with the public when, when we're discussing this. Um, I think it was Susu mentioned this as well, that scientists talk to, them, talk to each other and probably talk to ourselves as well in very high-minded uh, English language, uh, very unnecessary jargon. Um, but when you sort of when you're forced into the situation of uh, engaging with someone who doesn't, who one is not comfortable using the weird sciencey language that we use, and two is not familiar with the background information that we assume everyone else has, then we have to find a different way of talking about it, and I think that's necessary as well. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. No more. Would you like to go next? Hi, just to piggyback off uh, what Ryan said, um, on top of transformation and top of you know having representation in science and having inclusion, I think as you know a person, um, I think as a, a black female in this country, I think that um, a lot of the time it's very hard to speak up. Um, being the the mar minority, let's say in a seminar, in a workshop, in a conference, it's hard for you to say something, but if you see something problematic, if you see the problematic languages being used that, you know, challenge whom, whomever is using these kinds of words and, and sort of situations and just, I think, approach the situation as best and, and, you know, as possible, but also ask people why are they still using, you know, this old language that offends other people in this derogatory and does it actually need to be used still when there are other words that, are, that can be used. So I think that's my biggest thing is to actually engage and just actually confront and challenge, you know, what we see as problematic out there. Thanks, Norma. See you, see, so you can go ahead. Uh, as you know, I'm not a researcher myself, but I'm very lucky to uh, talk to a lot of scientists uh, all the time and uh, get to interview them. Uh, my favorite uh, people are scientists who, I mean, there's this little thing that uh, some scientists do, scientists that you know have gotten some training uh, or they've been, they've had some experience writing uh, or talking to journalists. Um, and it's great advice for anyone who, who talks to the media or anything like, like that, that have um, a sound bite ready um, and a set of answers that you're going to give no matter what the journalist ask you like they're going to ask you a lot of things but then in the end you want to control the narrative you want to uh be the one to um uh, like have something short and nice that you can give to the journalist uh to make sure that they don't misunderstand you uh so my point uh of that is 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 i've uh, it's 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 quite important to familiarize yourself with the language of how other people talk, other human beings 
talk, right? Yes, it's 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 important to continue sounding as smart as possible, use all the jargon and everything. Uh, but like, change your sentence structure a bit. Like, use more uh, uh, simple things. Like, use more um, active language. Uh, like, make it easier for someone else to read what you're writing. You're not dumbing it down. You're just changing it such that someone else understands it. Another scientist can easily engage with you. Uh, it can open a lot of opportunities. You can uh, start conversations and everything like that. So, um, so, so when it comes to the language of science and what I've experienced uh, so far, it's whenever there's an opportunity to get science communication training or science journalism training, uh, please take that opportunity. It opens so many doors for a lot of scientists to be able to write their own things. Um, I mean, a lot of some research, it's important that you speak to the, to the public yourself, right? Uh, it's important that you're able to speak to scientists outside your field because there's a lot of multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary stuff. Uh, if you only speak in the language that uh, your own peers understand, then it's it doesn't go uh, very far. So um, yeah, that's 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 what I think. Uh, that's my thinking in terms of the uh, language of science and where it is today. Like every opportunity you can get to be a better communicator, you should definitely take that. It will improve your work in some way. Or the other, even if you're not speaking to the public directly. Thanks, Ibusi. So that's good advice. I think I think all the scientists have joined us will appreciate that, and I'm gonna get some sound bites together. Um, and thank you, Norma and Ryan, as well, for your, I think, definitely transformation, um, including people of color in teams and ensuring that they are, they can talk about the language, they can engage with it, they can change it. Um, and am I frozen? And and Norma, I think as well. Um, no, it's just because you were sitting so still, Norma. Um, Norma, in terms of um, challenging the language, I so often we've heard terms that are derogatory and terms that should be left in the past at conferences in re when when referring to people who who are living right now and and perpetuates ideas that are. Um, that should have been left in the past um, and that we actively have to change. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience and I think we've been um, talking for a while so we can answer the questions. Um, so the first question is, Robin. Okay, so the first question has multiple questions. Guy. Oh, I was just going to say I lost your sound there. I could see you talking, but I couldn't hear anything. Okay. Oh no, I was yeah, I was just having a look at the questions. Um, so the first questions, the first question is why is it um, important to communicate in simple language for different stakeholders? Um. Um. And and do you why do you think people don't? I'm sort of summarizing the question. Um, like people sometimes they don't take the scientific knowledge seriously and and use that as a guide when making certain decisions. Um, yeah. And does anyone have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, Robin, can I please ask for clarity on that question? So she's what she's saying is why do you think um um uh she's asked Why, why do you think it is important to communicate 
Kate research. Um, second part of a question is that the public doesn't take and she wants to know. Why have I gone? Can you guys hear me? Um, and then, yeah, why why the public might resist research or might not engage with research? Robert, um, maybe if you are you guys you able to hear me? Off, I feel like maybe I'm, the maybe it'll be a little bit easier with the signal. Yeah. Okay. So can you hear me? The question is, um, why has what the first question is, why do we need to make science simple um, in order to communicate with the public? Um, and the second half of the question is that often the public would like they want to benefit from scientific research, but they also are resistant or they don't take science seriously. Um, and so the, why do you think sometimes the public doesn't take science seriously or engage with it seriously? Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I think for me, I wouldn't say that um, the public doesn't take doesn't take um, science seriously. Um, for example, in my own family, um, I'm Tosa, and they want to know what I do. It's hard to explain what I do in Tosa, and so at the end of the day, if, I, if I'm speaking um, and talking about genus paranthropus and geological this and geological that. I mean, my aunt, my normal aunt from the rules is going to be like, you know what, actually, I'm good because I don't know what you're saying mm -hmm. and completely lose interest because I'm not even trying to simplify, not even in the least, what a fossil is, what geology is, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think that people do not want to know what's going on in the world, what they live around, what is within this earth. I just think that the, the words are there, but the words are not being used. Um, and so I think that's why we need to actually try and translate these things and, and as scientists, you know, um, have a responsibility in order to try and educate as many people as possible, because I would never think in, in the slightest that anyone is uninterested in science. Um, people do have their, their interests and their passions, but I don't think it's a thing of people have a disinterest in science at all. People do want to know about where they come from, who they are, their lineage. I just think that we need to make that in more simple, understandable sort of uh, languages and be able to have these um, terms translated into all 11 official languages. We don't only live in an English um, English speaking um, sort of country. There are 11 languages as was explained and we need to be able to have everybody understand everything at all times. It's all about understanding, I think. Uh, in answer to that question quickly, uh, I would say that when when it comes to talking to the public, uh, having the facts alone doesn't matter. Like I said before, you can have all the information and throw it at people, but uh, it doesn't change uh, people's minds. So a lot of public, it depends on the science. A lot of public, a lot of the public don't take parts of science uh, seriously when. Um, I mean, the sentence that researchers say or scientists say carries a lot of weight. But then if every second week uh, that sentence, sentence comes with uh, researchers say chocolate is good, researchers say chocolate is bad within a couple of weeks, then um, that's when they start taking uh, science less seriously. It's not the scientist's fault that, that the way that is. It's just that there's a huge disconnect between scientists and uh, the public itself. By the time that story gets to the public, um, it's gone through so much um, sort of a term uh, called channelism. You'd have a, a science communicator at university that will take um, a scientist's research, they'll simplify it as much as possible. Rarely does it go back to the researcher for them to, 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 to verify. It just goes straight to the newspapers. The newspapers don't. Uh, because there's not many uh, trained science journalists, like there's a lot of brilliant uh, uh, science journalists in South Africa, but there's just not enough of them. Uh, so 
what happens is that a lot of publications as well don't want to pay for science journalism. So what happens is that they'll take that uh, press release as, as it is, and they'll put it in the newspaper verbatim, which it's, it breaks every rule in, 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 in journalism, but it happens because there's not much involvement of the researcher to make sure that whatever goes to the public is as they want it to be, right? So uh, for you as a researcher, if you want your work to be, um, to be taken seriously, make sure that you're familiar with every step of the process of what happens when your research, especially if it's public facing, what happens when it gets to, uh, to, to the public. It's important uh, for you as a scientist or as a, as a researcher to, to do that because um, the public are more and more aware that uh, it's, it's their funding that funds your research, right? So they want to, uh, they want to, you want to engage with them uh, in that way, not just leave it to someone else to take care of it. I'm, I'm sure, sure you're not going to do everything yourself, but it's just be familiar with the process, uh, reach out to your science communication uh, um, department at your university, uh, have contact with journalists, uh, just, just, just keep track of the whole process, of the whole pipeline of of the science. It's not that they, they don't take the science seriously, it's that they don't take their idea of science, which comes from other people and not the scientists uh, themselves. Thank you, Sibu Siso and Noma. Um, the next question is from Kim, and she, this is for Sibu Siso, um, she's asking what has the response been from local universities and organizations to translating research into indigenous languages? Have you found them to be deceptive? Has there been an active push on their part, or is it fleeting? And, and that's from Kim Tommy. Yeah. Hi Kim. Uh, so it's 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 uh, very quickly. It's I, I, there has been a response, but I wouldn't say it's a response to me and what I've done. I'm just very much in the public. Uh, but a lot of um, one example is uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal, which has uh, which has an app that translates um, a lexicon app that translates uh, scientific terms into Isuzu. It's a continuous thing that they've been doing a while before I came into the picture and um, tried to do what I'm doing at the moment. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it uh, in university press releases and things like that, but there hasn't been much action that I'm aware of. What's happened is that it's been, it's been used very much as a as great PR, like, hey, look at the great thing that we're doing. Um, yes, there's been, we see a lot of PhDs um, or a few PhDs in Isitosa and other things like that, but still it's, it's not so much the science being done in that language that's being, um, that's the point of the story. The story itself is the story. It's a lot of PR and it's great PR, I'll, ad I'll admit that. It's just, you don't see much of it being uh, used beyond uh, the PR that it generates. So uh, hopefully that might change that to the point that it's no longer amazing to hear that someone has done their PhD in Tosso or Isuzulu, that it's actually being, uh, there's, there's, being, there's some use that comes out of it, that it's better that this PhD is done in this language because it reveals so much, uh, something that an English one could not have done. And I'm waiting for a day when that's the case. Thank you. Robin, I think you're muted. Hi, sorry about that. Um, this is for Ryan and Norma, just from the comment section. Um, and if you do have questions, there is an ask a question box, um, but I do see there are some questions in the comments. Um, what, it, what has the reception been about your concerns? Have people taken your concerns seriously in terms of when you approach people about the language that they are using or the decision to use different terms? How have people responded to that? Do they take you seriously? 
Um, and this person is saying that um, Peter is saying that when they in, in, interact with um, scientists about using um, terms like tribe um, that are sort of outdated, they've been very, they've been, the, the scientists have been dismissive. So what has your experience been regarding challenging some of these terms? Uh, okay, then no, my view. Okay, I can go first. Um, cool. Yeah, so I think I was for the work that I was doing. I was quite lucky because um, for the most part, my supervisor for my PhD and my current uh, supervisor as well, like the, there isn't too much contention about the the, the choice of words. Um, in that I can liberally use. The, the terms that I think are better suited. Like I haven't had too much fight back with regards to that. Um, and more specifically about the university level stuff, I, 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 you know, for better or for worse, the university doesn't, my experience is that the university would not get too involved in the, the choice of words in an article. In fact, it would go the other way that if you were to use outdated words and you got a lot of attention for it, then I think there would be a bigger bite back because you get a, probably get some media attention. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about human genomics because there have been, um, for some high profile papers, there have been uh, like sort of journal articles where, the, you know, like a column, uh, opinion piece columns where someone would point out that, oh, you're using an outdated term or this is offensive and it shouldn't have been um, said in this way. And I think that kind of publicity would, would be bad. So, um, although I haven't had too much, again, I say I haven't had too much uh, feedback or bite back from the universities or any of the establishments that I've worked for. Um, to actually say that there's to have to have too strong an opinion on this. Um, I think on the other hand, I think it would be better if there was more involvement, then it would show some initiative from the side of the organizations. But uh, as long as things are going okay, then I think it's, it's, there hasn't been any issues. Yeah, I would say the same. Um, on my side, there there really hasn't been any sort of uh, um, um, fight back towards the words that uh, I use or I'm trying to to move away from. Um, you know, working with curators, you know, we and, and other people and sort of let's say Peter in the medical world, where uh, Robin and I were taking a human and, uh, biology class at med school and we had challenged um, the name using a porpoise. So referring to um, the, the homeless um, in Cape Town because they use those cadavers who have not been claimed. Um, um, people who have died have not been claimed, so they use those as cadavers. Or they use uh, people um, who will sign up, let's say, at these homeless institutions and they will have a sort of addendum that says when they die, they'll give up their body to science. So um, when we were confronted with that issue, you know, I know you and Robin and I, we felt, Robin and I felt very passionate about the fact that they're exploiting people. Um, and then on top of exploiting people, using that problematic language. And we had a very open and understanding professor who was able to um, try, try to change that and move away from that and actually have people come to the Red Cross and explain to the people and, and what happens when they find these things. and you know, keep them informed. So I think for me, it hasn't been uh, a negative experience when trying to challenge these problematic words or trying to use different words. I think it's been, I've been met with um, positive people. I've been met with people who also want to change um, and having supervisors who are also very forward thinking and want to see um, this sort of change happen. Um, so it's been, it's been a positive experience, you know, all around. Can I just add a quick comment on that? Just to say that, um, I, might, this, I mean, our experiences might also reflect why we're on this podcast today versus um, someone else, because we've been you know, privileged enough to be the students of people who are supportive and encouraging of the use of this word. So I'd imagine it's not, and unfortunately it's not everyone's experience. There might be a large number of students who had supervisors or collaborators on projects who um, were insistent on using offensive derogatory terms and just kind of, you know, swinging their, their weights, their, their um, experience in academia or their title as justification for why it should stick around. So, um, yeah, I, I for one, 
that just when the, when the question was read out, I just realized like how, how lucky I was in that sense that um, the people I've worked with have never been too, too sticky about like old habits that they just refuse to give up. And I think a lot of the time people refuse to give up on the old habits because they, they're hostile to the change rather than in, you know, see the necessity of the word. Thank you, Noma and Ryan. Yeah, and I think we 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 have been very really lucky, um, Noma as well, to be in a in a space where these the, those words are challenged, and um, when we engage around difficult words, we're not we we don't get fight back. We don't have to um, to deal with that difficulty. But I I do agree with Ryan. I think that maybe that is not representative of all experiences because I've often come across words in, in recently published um, articles that are quite, that are derogatory. And I think as as soon as we start seeing the human, these specimens as people, what Norma was saying, we start changing how we think about talking about them. Um, and we, we, and I think it will get scientists to move away from the derogatory words that they use if they if they understand the impact that it has i think i'm going to ask the last question because we are going on for an hour um and so that question also that was a similar question to robin's question so i'm not going to i'm going to skip over robin's question and i'm going to ask the question to see what see saw um this is from jade how have you approached translating jargon um should we create new words or expand the vocabulary um so have you um approach translating words into Zulu? Uh, very quickly on, on that question. Um, at the beginning, I was very hopeful. <laughs> Started uh, all very bright eyed and ready to uh, have like a lexicon where everyone would add stuff to it. Um, that I'm like studying a new evolution. Uh, everything's going to be uh, 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 rosy. It's going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to be great. And then I found out that after attending a conference of South African translators, they, they were translators who were talking about technological translations that they were making, their own lexicons that they were coming up with from the 90s, um, from a very long time ago that they were doing this. So it's, it's, it's people have been doing this for a very long time, but it's not being used anyway. And <laughs> that's the thing with, with language. If a word isn't being used, uh, then it just dies, no one uses it. And a lot of these scientific terms already exist uh, in, 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 in South African indigenous languages, locked up in people's PhDs uh, somewhere and other, other research. So it's, it's, it's for me, it, ha it doesn't seem very useful to try to do that. Uh, yes, that can be possible, we can do that, but it's not uh, the end all of changing the language uh, of science. I think Emphasizing again, and I'm biased as a science communicator, but more and more researchers should um, engage in science communication training. You learn so much uh, things that I take for granted as a writer that a lot of scientists don't know when it comes to communicating with other people. Translating stuff into uh, my native uh, language of Sizzle is just part of the science communication process. Don't separate it from uh, the rest of it. So it's just better communication and then the translating into your own home language comes with the territory. It's not something that you just want to seek out on its own or extend the vocabulary in that way. I think just extend your skills of um, communication. That's the biggest biggest lesson for me uh, that I've learned about uh, science communication or translating stuff is that you learn so much, um, even if you're not gonna, not gonna talk to the uh, public directly, but you learn a lot by being better able to uh, communicate your, your science. And if you want to translate it, then uh, it comes to the territory, it just becomes much easier. So I think that's how we broaden the conversation, broaden the vocabulary in that way. Um, thank you, Sibusi. So, yeah, I think that that those are very wise words. And I think I always, with my research, I always say, like, you may think that you are doing something new, but someone's done it before. <laughs> um, and so I think you've highlighted that with the lexicon and that and that we need to try new approaches um, and 
that the simplest thing to do is to to learn to communicate better as scientists in whatever language you're going to do that and so i want to say thank you so much for taking the time um to join us today um see we see so norma and ryan and sharing your experience and i think there were there were a lot of thought provoking um statements that you guys made and i'm sure a lot of the scientists will go back and think about the the language of their are using and definitely how they are communicating this science Hedy for hosting this um, along with digging in um, and hopefully we can have more conversations like this that will um, get science um, communication um, and so I think that's the end of the show I'm not It looks like we've lost Robin. In any case, it was nice to meet you guys, Norma, Sipo Sisu. Um, yeah. I had a really nice good time having this session. Nice to meet everyone, and thanks for all the questions and uh, interaction comments. Yeah, it's great to see such interest from everyone. Um, right, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Ciao, guys. <laughs>